Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve. He's in his series, Encountering the Real Jesus. And today you're going to discover the power and the peace that you can have in knowing that the Lord works with you and beside you in tough times. Today's lesson, When the Storms Meet the Savior. Bible, please turn to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. I wanted to speak to you this morning when the storms meet the Savior. Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35. The scripture says, And on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side. And leaving the multitude, they took him along with them, just as he was in the boat. And other boats were with them. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. And he himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And being aroused, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, why are you so timid? How is it that you have no faith? And they became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Life is filled with storms. It's filled with problems and difficulties, and as a friend of mine once said, life can be summed up in three phases. You're either uh, entering a storm, in a storm, or just got out of a storm to enter into another storm. Life is filled with difficulties and problems and storms. Job chapter 5 verse 7 says, man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. And the thing about troubles and problems and difficulties and storms, they can hit you when you least expect it, just as they hit the disciples that night on the Sea of Galilee. They weren't expecting a storm. It just arose. You know, you can be having a little pain and think it's not a whole lot of anything, maybe reflux, maybe a gallbladder, You go to the doctor, and you find out you have stage three cancer. You know, you can get in your car after a day at work, just gonna drive home, just routine like you always do, but then this time, you get hit head on by a drunk driver. You can get a phone call, the phone rings just like it always does, but this time, It's a family member that says there's been a crisis and our loved one is gone. Life can change just like that. And it's unwanted and it can be unexpected and it can throw you in tremendous turmoil. And then the question comes, well, what do I do now? What do I do with this? How can I handle this? We're in a series called Encountering the Real Jesus, and today we want to see what happens when the real Jesus meets your storm and the storm meets him, because the real Jesus is the one who can do anything. Now, in our text today, it's a very, very important text, not that... uh, Some texts aren't important, it's all the Word of God, but any time that you have a text that's included in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke, it's as if God is saying, now pay special attention to this because this is really important, that's why I've included it three times in my Word. 
And I don't believe anyone is here by accident. I think that God has brought us here today to speak to our hearts through the music and through this message when the storms meet the Savior. And no doubt, there are many in this room and you are experiencing a storm right now. And you are maybe feeling like the disciples, thinking that you're about to go under because of this financial problem, because of this marriage problem, because of this physical problem. And you're crying out, what do I do now? I want to share with you four things that you can do, and you can start them today that makes a huge difference in whatever storm you are facing. First thing you can do, you can trust in the Lord's word. You can trust in the Lord's word. Verse 35, and on that day, what day? The day that he had been teaching and he'd been teaching in parables and he'd been teaching and preaching all day. And teaching and preaching can zap you of strength and it's emotionally draining and Jesus was, and physically draining, and Jesus was tired and he uh, said, let us go over to the other side. At the end of that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. Matthew <clears throat> puts it this way, now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side. And then <clears throat> as we read in our story, Jesus went to sleep in the back of the boat because he was tired. And so here you have the Lord commanding the disciples to go over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee is, uh, uh, they call it the Sea of Galilee, it's a lake. <clears throat> it is, uh, it's about eight miles wide and about 13 miles long, and it's uh, 680 feet below sea level. <clears throat> very, very low, and it's surrounded by some mountains that are as high as 2,000 feet. So when you have uh, a very low-lying area that's going to be uh, semi-tropical and it's going to have warm air associated with it, uh, right next to a, an area that has cold air associated with it, the top of the mountains. When those come together, you can create some violent winds and some uh, difficult situations on the Sea of Galilee. And the way that the wind blows naturally through those mountains, it just can whip that thing up in a, in a short period of time. The Sea of Galilee at its deepest point is only 200 feet deep. So when you take a body of water that's not relatively not all that deep and you start hitting it with a lot of wind, you can create a severe, severe storm. And that's what they were in. It was a severe storm. Warren Wiersbe says in his commentary that he was on the Sea of Galilee and he was talking to uh, the, the guy that was running the boat that he was on. And he asked that man, he said, have you ever been in a storm on the Sea of Galilee? And he said, that man's eyes got really big and he said, one time. And I hope I never experience that again. Tremendous fear when you're in this huge storm on the Sea of Galilee. Well, these guys were in a storm, a terrible storm, and Jesus had told them, <clears throat> we're going over to the other side. He didn't say, guys, we're gonna get in the boat, we're gonna hit a storm, and we're going down. He didn't say we're going under, he said we're going over, we're going over to the other side. Now listen, when you are in a storm, and a big, big problem comes and plants itself right in your lap, what do you do? You remember what the Lord has said. You remember what the Lord has promised. And you put your trust in the Lord's word. And you cling to the Lord. We were singing today about coming to the Lord and coming to the king. What some people do when they're in difficulties, they, they run from the Lord. They get mad at God. No, you don't need to run from him. You need to run to him. And you need to take the promises of God and cling to those promises. Hebrews 10, 23 says this, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. The God who promised is faithful. And if we remain faithless, or if we are faithless, the scripture says, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. 
Second thing you can do, you can relax in the Lord's presence. Now, what does it say? Verse 36, verse 36, and leaving the multitude, they took him along with them just as he was in the boat, and other boats were with him. Verse 38, and he himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. The Lord is in the disciples' boat. Now, you say, oh, he's in the boat, but he's asleep in the boat. Yeah, shows the humanity of Jesus. The real Jesus is human. He's divine and he's human. He's the God-man, as much God as though he were not man at all, as much man as though he were not God at all. And the humanity of Jesus, he's worn out from ministering and preaching and teaching all day, and so he goes to sleep in the back of the boat. And it, and it shows the humanity and also shows the fact that Jesus is totally calm. He's totally at peace. He's not freaked out by the storm. Didn't catch him by surprise. He knows all things. But he's also fine in the storm. He's asleep in the storm because he's at peace, perfect peace. And the storm is no sweat to him. It's no worry to him. It's no problem to him. And it shouldn't have been to them. Well, you say, well, yeah, it should have been to them. No, this is why it shouldn't have been. Your troubles cannot drown you when Jesus is in your boat. That storm couldn't drown them when the Son of God was in their boat. And so they could have just said, hey, this looks bad, but hey, we walk by faith and not by sight. And what did he tell us to do? He told us we were going over to the other side. So, hey, John, you keep bailing, and, and uh, James, you keep rowing. I mean, that's what they needed to do. And they didn't need to freak out like they did. They could relax in the Lord's presence. You know, the scripture talks about a peace that surpasses understanding, that surpasses comprehension, the peace of God. And when we go through a terrible, terrible storm and we still have peace, what a testimony. How does that happen? It happens when you understand that the Lord is with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? Because he is with me. And his rod and his staff, they comfort me. Third thing you can do, you can rest in the Lord's love. So here's the situation. The water is coming in, and it just came upon him out of nowhere. And it's at night on the Sea of Galilee, and they're in not a very big boat. If you've ever go to, to uh, the Holy Land, they want to take you to the Jesus boat, which is a boat that they found uh, during the time period of the first century, and they say this is, a, this is about the size of the boat that Jesus would have been in. Not a big boat, especially for uh, 13 people. And so they were in this little boat and they're trying to sail across and the wind is blowing and the water is whipping and it's coming into the boat and they can't bail it out fast enough and the boat is filling up and they think they're going to die. These are experienced fishermen, but they think this is the worst storm that I've ever been a part of and I don't think we're gonna make it and here is Jesus, he's asleep. He's the rock of ages. He sleeps like a rock. You'd have to sleep through it like a rock if you're gonna sleep through a storm like that. He's asleep. And so they're like, well, I think we'd better wake him up. And so it's probably Peter that woke him up. He always was kind of volunteered for the dumb stuff. And so he comes back there and he wakes him up and he says to him, Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? Don't you even care? We're about ready to die and you're asleep don't you even care? When you go through a terrible storm in your life, it's easy to ask the Lord, God, don't you care about me? Don't you even care about me? It's a common question. I think when we ask that question, even though it's a common question, even though it's a pretty natural question, it's almost like balling up your fist and punching the Lord in the heart. The Lord is saying, you're asking, you're asking me if I care for you. You're asking me, do I not even care for you? He said, do you see my hands? Big nail scars in his hands where he took the nails for you. 
He shows you his feet, big holes in his feet. You see my feet? Where I took the nails for you? He pulls up his shirt. He shows you his wounded side where they thrust that spear and the blood and the water flowed. He said, do you see this? Do you see all my scars? I did it all because I care for you. Because I don't want you to perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I did that all because I care so much for you. The scripture says that we can be assured of God's love and God's care for us. You know how much the Lord loves you? This is mind-blowing. How much does the Father love little old you and little old me? John chapter 17, verse 23. Jesus said this, I and them and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. How much does God love you as much as he loves Jesus? That's what Jesus said. How much does Jesus love you? John chapter 15, verse nine. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Stay in my love. Remain in my love. Hey, we could say rest in my love. And lastly, you can rejoice in the Lord's power. So what happens in this little story, in this situation, this real-life situation? Well, they wake up Jesus, Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? And being aroused, what does he do? He goes from the back of the boat to the front of the boat, and he says, hush, be still. And immediately, the wind stopped, and the waves stopped. Now, it's one thing for the wind to stop, but it's another thing for the waves to stop because we know that once the water gets going, it doesn't just go from uh, going into the boat, coming at you at a, at a hard pace to stopping. It doesn't do that, but it does when the Lord says it. It does when the Lord rebukes the wind and the waves. It does when the Lord says, hush, be still. And all of a sudden, everything was just perfectly calm. Whoa. And then what does he do? Then he looks back at the guys and he says, why are you so timid? Why are you shaking? Why are you thinking you're gonna die? Why are you so timid? How is it that you have no faith? Man. You mean this whole thing was a test of faith? Yes. It was a test of of faith. Storms, the Lord uses them to test our faith. Jesus had been teaching all day, and these guys were privy to hear him teach, and then all of a sudden, just like any teacher, we're going to teach, and then we're going to take a test, and this was a pop quiz because they didn't know it was coming, but the Lord knew it was coming, and they didn't do well on the test. Why are you so timid? How is it that you have no faith? Well, what was the faith response? He said, let us go over to the other side. Faith is trusting God's word and believing what God says. And if he says we're going over to the other side, we're going over to the other side. He didn't say we're going under. He said we're going over. And that is faith. And the faith response in this situation is you keep rowing the dumb boat. And you just trust that the Lord is going to see you through. He uses storms to test our faith. Listen, a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. If you have a faith that has never been tested, how do you know that you can count on it? In 2005, the Lord led me to start From His Heart Ministries, the radio and television ministry of the pulpit of our church, just the sermons from our church. And the Lord led me to do that. And two guys, he put it upon their hearts to give me a total of $35,000 to start the ministry. This is separate from First Baptist Church, so it's not a burden on the finances of First Baptist Church. So we started up, and I was feeling pretty good. We have $35,000. I went to my first National Religious Broadcasters Convention in Los Angeles in 2005, February 2005. And I, I remember at my first meeting, uh, at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention, it became pretty uh, apparent that this was gonna cost a whole lot more money than I thought. 
And I remember asking my friend Carl Townsend, who had been in that business for a long, long time, I said, Carl, I was thinking 35,000 was pretty good to start off. Well, what do you think? He said, well, in order to do this, you need to have about $500,000. I said, how much? He said, 500,000. I said, well, that's a lot. Oh, I don't have that much. I'm never gonna have that much. I remember going home just thinking, there's no way this is gonna work, Lord. There's no way that I can raise $500,000. And right at the beginning of the ministry, I was ready to throw in the towel. And the Lord convicted me and said, you know, I guess I'm a pretty small God to you. I guess I'm the God of 35,000, but can't be the God of 500,000. I mean, what's 500,000 to God? It's nothing, nothing to God. It's huge to me. But it's nothing to God, and God really convicted me. He says, you're walking by sight and not by faith. Why don't you trust me? Why don't you believe me for something big? So I said, all right, Lord, I apologize. I'm sorry. Forgive me for, for thinking so small. And I, I don't know where that money's gonna come from. It was about two weeks later, I got a check in the mail, unsolicited. Hadn't talked to this person at all about this. He gave me a check for $100,000. About a month later, I got another check for $100,000. About six months later, I got another check for $100,000. And the Lord was saying, you don't think I can do this? I can do this. And maybe you're like me. Maybe you, you just need to say, I've been thinking too small with what God can do. I need to start expanding my Horizons. The scripture says, now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory. He is able to do all things so you and I can rejoice in the Lord's power. Now I wanna show you one last thing and we'll be done. There is a key word in this passage. It's the Greek word megas, M-E-G-A-S. It doesn't show up obviously in the English translation, but it's used to describe the wind. In verse 37, and there arose a fierce gale of wind, a megas gale of wind. Megas means great, a megas gale of wind. And then it's used to describe the calm that came in verse 39. When he said, hush, be still, the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. It became megas calm, a great calm. And then it's used in verse 41 where it says they became very much afraid. Uh, that's a megas fear, a megas awe. Megas, megas, megas. What is the message there? The message is this. There are great storms in life that you're gonna face and I'm gonna face. But there is a savior who can speak a word to your great storm, to bring about a great calm, to produce in you a great awe, so that you might realize that he indeed is the great God who can do anything in your life. And the question is this, will you trust him? My friend, the way you encounter the real Jesus in your heart that changes your life is when you open your heart to him. If you've never done that, if you believe in Jesus in your head, but you've never trusted him with your heart, today is the day for you. Just pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself, but I believe that you are God in the flesh I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. I wanna follow you all the days I have left. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You 
really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. Today's single message, When the Storms Meet the Savior, is available on CD, DVD, USB, or MP3 download when you call 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org. The message is also part of the series, Encountering the Real Jesus. In our world filled with fake news and fake people, it can be difficult to know the real truth. And when it comes to Jesus of Nazareth, the lies about him run rampant. That's why this month we're in my series, Encountering the Real Jesus, so we can learn directly from the scriptures who he really is and what he really said and did and what that means for you and me. Now, sadly, there are many people who say they follow Jesus, but their Jesus is created in their own minds to satisfy their own desires. Listen, Jesus is not who you want him to be. He is who he is. And now in this series, Encountering the Real Jesus, will shine the light on the true identity, character, mission, and message of this one called the Christ. I hope you'll get Encountering the Real Jesus today, and may God use it to bring a real revival to your life. For your gift of any amount to support the work of From His Heart this month, we'll say thank you with two important resources. Pastor Jeff's inspiring booklet, Real Revival, and the powerful seven-message series, Encountering the Real Jesus. It's available in the format of your choice. Call 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org and make your gift today and get these inspiring and timely resources. And thank you for watching From His Heart today, the viewer-supported broadcast outreach of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth.